Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Welcome to the Avexia webinar series. Our topic for tonight is Health Implications of Mold Toxicity, Signs and Symptoms You Shouldn't Ignore. My name is Christopher Chu. I am the Director of Marketing for Avexia Diagnostics and will be your host for this evening. Today, I have the distinct pleasure of being joined by our guest, Dr. Elizabeth Seymour who will be our presenter for this webinar. Dr. Seymour was raised in Denton, Tex Denton, Texas, where she attended Ryan High School and then went on to receive her bachelor at Texas Women's University. She obtained her medical diploma from St. Matthews University School of Medicine on Grand Cayman Island and completed her residency at Oklahoma University Health Sciences Center. Dr. Seymour is board certified in family medicine and also holds a master's degree in health services administration. She currently works as a physician at Environmental Health Center of Dallas and as a medical consultant for real-time laboratories in Carrollton, Texas. Joining Dr. Seymour tonight will be Dr. Wayne Sedano, our Director of Clinical Support and Education at Avexia Diagnostics. Additionally, Dr. Sedano is the Director of Integrative Medicine Education for the College of Integrative Medicine and lectures and teaches internationally. Before we begin, just a bit of housekeeping. We encourage participation. So if you have a question, you may submit your question in the questions field in the right-hand area of the interface. We will answer submitted questions towards the end of the presentation. If your questions are not answered this evening, you will surely receive an answer by email within a day or two. Without further delay, I will now turn the webinar over to Dr. Seymour. Hi, everyone. Nice to meet you again. I'm Dr. Seymour. Thank you for that introduction. And I'm going to talk about the health implications of mold toxicity. There's many signs and symptoms that patients can present with, and you do not want to ignore your signs or symptoms, especially if it's due to mold or mycotoxins. So who are we? I'm a clinical consultant with Real-Time Laboratories in Carrollton, Texas, and we're a patient-focused laboratory that's dedicated to serving the public by looking past a surface level of diagnosis of chronically ill patients, and we help uncover the source of their sickness and their symptoms. We can receive clinical and environmental tests from both domestic and international patients in over 40 countries around the world. Our qualifications include that we are CAP and CLIA accredited since 2007. Our laboratory is also has the fastest turnaround time in the industry. We usually take a week, maybe up to 10 days, once we receive the specimen for the time for the lab to process and produce a result. And we have over 30 years of research. We're a medical team that includes a PhD, a laboratory director, a pathologist, and a medical doctor, and we've studied and become the industry leaders in mycotoxin research for over 30 years. So let's start off. What are mycotoxins? Mycotoxins are literally a poison that is produced by mold. Mold is in the fungi kingdom, and mycotoxins are very small molecules. I call them nanoparticles that are produced by molds. They are toxigenic to humans and other animals, such as dogs and horses. There are hundreds of molds that have been identified, but only a small portion of the molds are associated with indoor mold growth and pose a human health risk. Real-time lab will test for 16 of the most toxigenic mycotoxins found in both the body and the environment. So we group our mycotoxins in um, four, I'm sorry, five separate groups that we test. There are multiple mycotoxins in certain groups such as aflatoxin and trichothecene, um, but the main ones are aflatoxin, ochratoxin A, zeralinone, gliotoxin, and then trichothecene. So let's talk about the aflatoxin group. This is a, a family of fungus strains that are generally um, 
affect plant products. Um, when you have aflatoxin, it can increase your risk of liver cancer, hepatitis, cirrhosis, and many other health issues. It generally occurs when an animal is consuming a contaminated plant, such as hay or feed, or if we're eating the meat or dairy from an animal that has eaten the contaminated feed. You can also get this from inhaling dust uh, while working, in, um, working with contaminated products. For instance, if there's a hay in a barn and the hay produces aflatoxin and there's dust from you know, moving the hay around, you can inhale it that way. The next mycotoxin is the microcyclic trichothecene group. In short, we call it a trichothecene. It is produced by five different types of funguses and it can include 170 different types of mycotoxins. It thrives in plants and crops, but is more common in the soil and decaying organic matter. It's usually found in water damaged buildings, and there are several types of trichothecenes that are produced, but most commonly by Stachybotrys, also known as black mold. Okra toxin A is the next mycotoxin that we test, and it is specifically produced by the fungus Aspergillus and Penicillium species. It's one of the most abundant food contaminating mycotoxins, and it contaminates uh, water damaged homes or buildings. It can also affect heating ducts and be associated with um, air and ventilation and, and heating vents that can be um, contaminated with moisture problems and humidity. Exposure can also come from just inhaling the mold and the mycotoxins when you're in a water damaged building. The next one is xeralinone, and xeralinone is produced commonly by the mold called fusarium. So this is a big hormone disruptor. It causes increased activation of estrogen receptors, and this can lead to multiple reproductive um, sexual disorders, such as low sperm count. You can have abnormal levels of progesterone. You can have problems with ovulation and pregnancy. Women can have abnormal periods that are heavy or clotty or um, painful and infrequent or often more often than normal. Babies that are born can have a reduced birth weight and there's also a lower fetal survival rate. So you would think about this in your patients that have um, PMS symptoms, menopausal, perimenopausal symptoms. It's not that they won't naturally go through those types of symptoms as they go through um, the decades and the woman's natural change. But if you have a young female, such as a teenager or a 20 year old or a 30 year old, it'd be unusual for them to have these types of disorders or symptoms. And you may want to evaluate for xeralinone. The last one that we look at is to me, one of the most toxigenic is gliotoxin. So it's known to be an immunosuppressant. It's found in many homes and buildings, but um, it generally only infects individuals with a compromised immune system. And for this reason, if you're immune compromised, it can also be deadly. So you have to be very careful about this. And I'm gonna talk a little bit in the future on slides about what the immune system evaluation needs to look like. Aspergillosis um, is the common condition that is diagnosed when you have high levels of gliotoxin, and it's one of the leading causes of death in immunocompromised patients. So this slide is just correlating the relationship between a mold and a mycotoxin. If you look on the left, that's gonna describe the species of the mold. And if you look on the right, that is the mycotoxin that is produced by that specific mold. So we'll start at the top. If aflatoxin is coming back positive on a dust swab or a urine test, you're gonna be correlating that with aspergillus family. The next one is the ochre toxin mycotoxin. And if you look to your left on the species, there's multiple aspergillus, all the A.niger and all the rest of them are aspergillus family. 
It's also associated with the penicillium family. The third one is the trichothecenes, and those again are associated mostly with stachybotrys, but also trichoderma. Gliotoxin mycotoxin is again associated with aspergillus. The two uh, species include versicolor and fumigatus. And then lastly, your zeralinone is associated with the fusarium mold. So let's talk about the exposures to toxigenic molds and mycotoxins. Where are you going to see this? It's most common that people get exposed to the mycotoxins and to the molds, obviously. Um, and animals as well will get ex exposed to this. Um, through inhalation and dermal absorption. So these are nanoparticles. They're very small. You may see mold on a wall or in a building, and you may not feel anything, but you will absorb those mycotoxins through breathing them in and through your skin. I kind of tell patients that the skin and the derm dermatologic organ is like a veil. You can't see through it, but it's very porous and that's how you absorb these toxins. The other way that you're gonna be exposed to them is obviously through water damaged buildings. If there's been a flood, if there's been a hurricane, if there's a leak in a roof, if there's a pipe that's busted from a freeze, there's multiple reasons why there's an increased risk of mold growth from humidity, water, moisture. And then once that mold grows, those mycotoxins also start to become produced and you're exposed to them even though you can't see them. And then we can also be exposed to mycotoxins through contaminated food or drink. This would sp specifically be associated with aflatoxin. Um, we're going to do our best to not eat spoiled food and you know, molded bread and molded fruit. Um, but the best thing you want to do is make sure you're eating organic, fresh fruits and fresh um, bread if you're eating bread. And that way you'll decrease your risk of mycotoxin exposure. So what are the common symptoms that we see and how did the patients with mycotoxins that are elevated in their body, how do they present? There are a multitude of symptoms that you can have a patient complain of and describe. Um, that I'll start with the most common one is usually gut issues. And so any type of gastrointestinal stress, distress, including irritable bowel syndrome, which is to me the diagnosis of exclusion. There could be nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal cramps, bloating, pain. If they have some form of arthritis or swollen joints or painful joints, they may have overall generalized weakness in their body. They may also have weakness or pain in their muscles. The third is the sinus infections that occur. So I always term this as the typical allergy symptoms, the Zyrtec commercial, the coffee, wheezy, sneezy, rashy, itchy, runny, eye, runny nose, runny, teary eyes, um, sometimes wheezing with asthma, but generally they get so much mucus project, production and congestion and swelling and edema in their sinuses that that gets packed and they get pressure and a headache and pain. And that's a setup for a bacterial secondary infection from the sinuses. And many patients need antibiotics and sometimes steroids and nasal rinses to help treat that. The next are your neurologic conditions. Headaches are very common, especially migraines and um, brain lesions. And when I say brain lesions, that could be a multitude of symptoms. Um, worst case scenario is if you see plaques and lesions on the brain that are associated with multiple sclerosis. Um, also, some patients can have ischemic changes or um, cerebral vascular accidents such as strokes that can lead to a lesion and abnormal MRI or CAT scan could occur. Probably the number one or most common symptom and complaint that I get is I'm always tired, doctor. So if they have chronic fatigue, um, if they're sleeping 20 hours a day and still waking up, not feeling rested, 
then you're going to want to make sure you rule out common things that cause fatigue, such as low thyroid, you know, poor oxygen levels, sleep apnea, anemia. But um, fatigue is a very common symptom that our patients will complain of. The next are usually associated with asthma or the respiratory system, which includes shortness of breath or dyspnea. Then we go back to the neurocognitive problems that can happen neurologically. If a patient says, I can't think clearly, I have memory loss, I feel like I have dementia and I'm 20 or 30 or 40 years old. If they have brain fog, if they have problems with stuttering or slurred speech, if they're confused. I had a woman today tell me that she couldn't remember her son's name. So these can be pretty um, impactful cognitive impairments that can occur. The next is your ENT. So we've already talked about the nose and the throat. The ears are important. Some patients will have hearing loss and many will have ringing or tinnitus that occurs in their ears. And then we get to the dermatologic organ, which includes the rashes, the lesions. Sometimes patients will have eczema or dermatitis, and they usually can have um, spontaneous bruising and bloody lesions like hemangiomas or, again, spontaneous bruises that they didn't have anything traumatic or an injury that would have caused that bruise. Now, how do we look for mycotoxins in immunocompromised patients? You may not be aware that your patient is immunocompromised, but when patients come in with 20 to 30 different symptoms and they tell you, I see mold, I smell a musky odor, or a, a, a concern for a moldy smell or mildew smell, um, and they're having all these symptoms, you're gonna wanna look at their immune system. So most primary doctors and internists will check a blood count, a CBC. And if that blood count shows abnormal neutrophils or lymphocytes that are low, that's a key um, laboratory result that would prompt you to wanna do a deeper dive and a further evaluation to look at your patients and make sure they don't have anything else unusual going on with their immune system. So this includes evaluation of TNB lymphocytes, also known as T cells and B cells. We would want to look at their immunoglobulins, and that's full spectrum, which includes IgA, IgE, IgM, and IgG with the IgG subclasses or subsets, one through four. Sometimes if the blood work, such as the TNB lymphocytes and the immunoglobulins come back normal, there's also a function test of the immune system that we do. It's called a cell-mediated immunity test. CMI is the short acronym we use for it. They can also be called a DIT, a delayed uh, immunotherapy test. And that is basically a skin test where there's usually eight different um, markers that we put place on a patient's forearm and we make an impression and then we read that evaluation of that skin test 48 hours later. If that shows an abnormality, then they again have poor function of their immune system. Next, you're gonna really wanna be in depth with your clinical history and you're gonna ask them if there's any history of autoimmune disorders. Autoimmune disorders are commonly thought to be genetic, so a family history is extremely important, but you're also gonna to wanna to ask about other autoimmune disorders. Excuse me, those include, um, most common autoimmune disorder that I see is thyroid abnormalities. So if a patient comes in and says they have hypo or low thyroid, more commonly, you're going to see low thyroid than you are hyperthyroid or high thyroid. Always check antibodies to make sure they don't have Hashimoto's or Graves disease. That would include TPO, thyroid peroxidase antibodies, and thyroglobulin antibodies to rule out if there's any autoimmune thyroiditis that's occurring. If they've been diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis, um, Crest syndrome, scleroderma, polymyalgia rheumatica, um, lupus. These are just common autoimmune disorders that patients get diagnosed with, and those are autoimmune diseases. 
The other thing you're going to want to ask is based on their medications, the current and their historical medication usage. Have they been on anything that has suppressed their immune system, such as steroids? That could be a medrol dose pack, methylprednisolone, triamcinolone, um, any type of immune system um, response that's depressing the immune response is considered a suppressant of the immune system. And steroids are the most common of those that are used. Those could also be steroid injections. Some patients, such as those that have um, rheumatoid arthritis, may be on drugs called DMARDs or disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. Those can be things like Humira, Remicade, um, Embril, and then there's tumor necrosis factor inhibitors or TNF inhibitors that continue to go down the spectrum of suppressing your immune system. Now I'm going to give you a case example. This is a personal patient of mine um, and her initials are JC. So she was a 47 year old female that presented to me about two months ago. She was a new patient. She had moved recently to Texas from New Mexico. So dry desert area in New Mexico, moving to Texas. It depends on what part you move to, um, whether you're going to be at a higher humidity level, such as the Gulf and the coast and Houston area. If you move in West Texas, it's going to be more dry and de desert and dust. And North Texas has a lot of um, trees and seasons. East Texas has the piney woods. So there's many different things that in this big state, we can be exposed to multiple seasons and different um, geographical climates that can occur. So she moved from New Mexico to Texas in the North Texas DFW area, and she was experiencing a multitude of symptoms, but that started with allergic rhinitis or allergies, and she associated that in the springtime with the pollens that were being produced. She'd never had allergies before. She con continued to progress and started to develop a truncal and pelvic pain. She had a history of a kidney stone, and so she thought she was having a recurrent kidney stone or nephrolithiasis. She was evaluated in the ER and had a urinalysis and an x-ray and a CAT scan, and everything looked normal. There were no significant findings. She'd seen multiple physicians, including her primary care physician. They had tried multiple medications on her. She thought that she had um, bent over in her work and strained her back. She tried opioid pain pills. She tried muscle relaxants. She tried anti-inflammatories. She tried Tylenol and acetaminophen and didn't get any relief. She thought she, again, herniated a, a disc in her back and she had an MRI and that was negative. And then at night, her husband was complaining that she didn't sleep, but when she did fall asleep, she was having these jerking movements. Just, we were thinking restless leg syndrome or um, some type of, um, you know, motor muscle movement where she was involuntarily jerking at night and it was waking her up. So what she noticed was that when she moved to Texas and she started working in this building, she had to go home because of the COVID pandemic and they closed her workplace down and she started doing work from home virtually. She noticed that her symptoms improved when she was working from home during this time. So as she continues, the COVID pandemic started to subside, things started to open up again, she returned to work, and then all of a sudden her symptoms reoccurred. So the light bulb went off that this was something that was occurring at work, not at home. She had neurocognitive problems, which included an inability to organize herself. When she was at work, she claimed she was a type A patient and that she was a really good employee. And she even told me that she got written up at work for poor work performance, which was really disheartening to her because she took pride in being a good employee and said, I don't know why I can't do my job properly and I can't remember and I can't keep things organized and complete tasks. So she got written up. Uh, she noticed that her workplace was leaking water every time it rained and there, there was visible mold in the walls. And the workplace when she walked in also had a bad odor that smelled musky. So she called a health inspector. The health inspector came and he suggested treating it with bleach and painting over the mold. 
which if you don't know is a very ineffective way to treat mold and to especially it does not kill mycotoxins bleach does not and painting over it doesn't help it'll just grow right through so she told her um her employer that many other employees were complaining of getting sick including herself she put in multiple work tickets and requests to have the mold problem looked at and the roof and the leaks fixed and the mold on the wall removed and she didn't have any result with her employee no resolve of these issues so she left her workplace and she was applying for workers comp and when she went back to um, return her keys the workplace was closed due to quote construction um, really it was due to remediation so she came to us and we do allergy skin testing and we tested her skin and it proved that she had an allergy to mold we also did a pulmonary function test or a spirometry which proved that she had mild airway obstruction which would be associated with the dyspnea or the cough or the wheezing that she was experiencing. And we did a urine mycotoxin test and it showed that she had mycotoxins in her urine. So these are the results of JC's mycotoxins. And unfortunately, she tested positive and present for all of the mycotoxins, ochratoxin A, aflatoxin, trichothecene, gliotoxin, and xeralinone. So again, it's only going to come back with five actual tests, but we're testing for 16 different mycotoxins in the specific group or class or family of those mycotoxins. So you see that it's a urine specimen, and what happens is you'll receive a kit, and the kit has a cup in it, and the patient urinates in the kit and sends it back to the lab. It shows the value, and then the result will either say present, not present, or equivocal. And then you have your lab reference ranges, which will give you how it came up with the present or if greater than or equal to so many parts per billion, that would be considered a present result. The equivocal is kind of in the middle in between and not present is if it's less than that specific parts per billion. So the second page of a real-time mycotoxin urine report will show the actual um, levels in a graph. And I like this because you can kind of quantify how high or how low are they. So if you look at aflatoxin or any of these results, there's a blue bar that's in the middle of it. If it is above the blue bar, it's going to be considered present. If it is below the blue bar, it's going to be considered uh, not present. And if it's on the blue bar, it's going to be considered equivocal. Now, sometimes I get questions about equivocal. What that means is that there is a mycotoxin level that is present, but it's not high enough to be considered positive or present because of the lab's reference ranges. And what I'd like to point out is if you look at aflatoxin kind of being on the gray area, trichothecene's also on the gray bar above the blue bar, and xeralinone's in the gray area. But look at ochratoxin. Ochratoxin is off the chart, and it's in what I call the white zone. And look at gliotoxin. Gliotoxin's right on the edge of, of extremely high. So when, I, when you see these values over that gray marker, that means that they have a very high exposure to mold and that the mycotoxins that they're releasing in their urine is excessive. Now, the other part of this is, this is what I consider um, JC's baseline test. So it's confirming that she has mycotoxins, is giving us an idea of what types of mold she was exposed to and all the mycotoxins that she's coming back positive for. But the point that I'm going to show you is um, when JC goes through getting out of that environment, which is foundational and avoiding the exposure to mold, and also going on a detox protocol, what we want to see in the future is that the all of these, the aflatoxin, gliotoxin, especially ochratoxin, trichothecene, and xeralinone all go down, and you'll see a line graph, and you want that value, that blue dot, to go below the blue bar and you'll see a connected line graph. So sometimes these may go up 
if they're really doing you know potent detoxification but they also may go up if they're still exposed to the mold and the mycotoxins in their home or workplace or environment and it may be unbeknownst to them but what you want to know is in the future that these values are coming down that's ideal the next is how do we do our testing so at real-time lab our mycotoxin testing is through a device called eliza and eliza has a lot of different advantages and i'm going to compare eliza to our competitors which are generally testing mass spectrometry so the mycotoxin um, report is based on parts per billion of a urine specimen and this provides a good actually a greater sensitivity and a greater specificity when you're doing parts per billion versus parts per million. It's performed as a semi-quantitative test that helps physicians and providers know whether it is positive, which would be present, or negative, and it gives you a numerical value. And then when you repeat those tests in the future after three or six months or a year of detoxification, you can track those patients' progress to tell them and advise them looks like things are going well and they're low, or it looks like they're going up and, and are we missing something or is the patient missing something? The next is the cost of this test is much cheaper than mass spectrometry. Um, so it's an effective modality. It's not cheap, but it's cheaper than the mass spec um, technology. And then we also can test multiple specimen samples. So Urine is going to be your most common form that we receive for testing, but we can also do nasal secretions. There are tissues that um, will have biopsies that we can test specifically to see if a um, tumor or um, a hysterectomy with a woman that had abnormal bleeding or some type of tissue specimen comes back positive for mycotoxins. And then we also work with pulmonologists who do um, BALs or bronchial alveolar lavages. So let's talk about our competitors versus real time. Again, real time lab does ELISA testing. Our competitors usually will use mass spectrometry. Um, the ELISA is, has been peer reviewed in literature and it's well characterized. And this is a accepted and approved test by the FDA. The mass spec technology is not approved by the FDA for toxins, except for a vitamin D assay. Real-time technology is accepted and approved also for the mycotoxin evaluation by the USDA. The mass spec technology is not approved by the USDA for mycotoxins. The way we do our test through ELISA is monoclonal or polyclonal antibodies for detection. And there are many um, cross reactions that occur with many in-kind mycotoxins, specifically given the trichothecenes. There's a list of those different mycotoxins that are associated with Stachybotrys that are under the trichothecene family. And most antibodies are proprietary in nature. For mass spec, there's no certified material that's available for many of the parent compounds or any other modified standards by ring form or CH or sulfohydryl groups to identify related mycotoxins. The other is with the real-time lab, we have CLIA and CAP approval. We are compliant in all our chemistry and immunology areas of the regulatory agencies coming and evaluating us. With mass spec, that, um, it, they unfortunately experience compliance issues, and that's due to the limitations for the parameters that are set with ion ratios and retention ratios. For, for instance, you may have an analyte like a mycotoxin suppression, which can lead to a false negative result. All right, so, how do we test your home or your work environment for mycotoxins? Real-time doesn't all, only offer a urine test for the body and the human being. It also offers a test called EMMA. It's like a little girl's name, but EMMA stands for the Environmental Mold and Mycotoxin Ass Assessment. 
So you're going to treat your home just the way you're going to treat your body. You're going to treat it the same. The mycotoxin poisoning is always going to have a source. So if you have a patient that comes in with mycotoxins on their urine, you have to help them figure out where in their environment they're getting exposed to this. And they need to treat their environment in order to heal their body and prevent the exposure to molds. So the Emma test is going to test for 10 different types of toxigenic molds. It's a very sensitive molecular detection technology. And again, there are hundreds and thousands of molds. We're testing for toxigenic molds. It's gonna determine the presence and their relative abundance, giving you a number of the value and how many spores are present. The Emma test is also gonna test directly for the 16 different poisonous mycotoxins. And this is a patented mycotoxin detection test. So you'll hear many of your patients say or ask the question, what is the difference between an Emma and an ERMI? So an Emma test is a dust swab or a dust sample. It kind of looks like a Q-tip and you're gonna swab the interior areas of the home or the office or whatever environment or building that you're concerned with mold and mycotoxin exposure. And it's gonna test for the 10 different mold organisms and the 16 different mycotoxins that are produced by those molds. The ERMI stands for the Environmental Relative Mold Index. This does not test for the mycotoxins. All it can test for is the molds in the environment. So it's gonna miss those mycotoxins that can cause very serious disease in your bodies, not only to humans, but also to animals. We get many patients that call us saying, my pet is sick, my dog is sick, well, how can I help them? The Emma also comes with a brief description, which I'll show you in a minute. And it guides you on the relationship from the molds to the mycotoxins gives you a description of the disease and the areas and the organs of the body that are affected. Once again, an ERMI um, was developed by the EPA as a research tool, but it has not been validated through credentialing for routine public use in any building, including a home, a school, or a work environment. Real-time laboratory is accredited by these regulatory organizations, including CAP and CLIA, to perform a mold and mycotoxin test. And it has four inspections a year by CAP since 2011. So we excel and exceed the results in every inspection we have. So this is an example of what a test result will look like when you do an EMMA. It's a PCR polymerase chain reaction. It's a quantitative test. And as you see, there are 10 different molds that we're testing for. Those listed include some Aspergillus, Ketonium, and Stachybotrys, Candida, and Fusarium. You'll see in the middle where it says results. Looks like we've got a little bit of Ketonium globus, globosum but the stachybotrys is the one that is really high and that's why I've highlighted it. And then if you look on the very right where the spore counts are, it shows you the spores per milliliter that are detected. And if you look at the bottom left of the page, this is gonna give you an example of where this came from. So this is a, a again, a, a patient that submitted and then she was living with her grandma and it was her grandma's bathroom. So you can identify it's the garage, the AC vents, the windows, the kitchen, the washroom, the bathroom, you want to identify what room it is so that we can correlate the area where you tested. The next is the mycotoxin report off the EMA test. So again, this is an ELISA-based test. We're going to test for ochratoxin, aflatoxin, trichothecene, gliotoxin, and zeralinone. And if you look at the bottom of the report, this again is the swab that came from the grandma's bathroom. And the highlighted area shows you that the trichothecene group, which is correlated with the stachybotrys mold, came from a dust specimen and that the value is excessively high, 0 0.048 parts per billion, and its result is considered present. 
And then again, you have your reference ranges of what is not present, what is considered equivocal, and then anything over 0.08 parts per billion on the trichothecene group is considered present. The third page of all your EMMA and urine mycotoxin reports from real time will give you a brief explanation of what these environmental molds are. So again, you see on the left, the mold is the stachybotrys. The mycotoxin that is, is produced is the trichothecene. And then we'll give you potential health issues that can be correlated with these types of molds and mycotoxins. Reiterating that Stachybotrys is commonly known as a black mold. It's highly toxic to human beings. There are multiple symptoms that can occur, including nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, burning, redness or erythema, ataxia, chills, fevers, hypotension or low blood pressure, hair loss, confusion, many symptoms that individuals that are living or working inside a stachybotrys or a moldy infested home or building can experience these types of symptoms. The next page, which is the fourth page of your lab result, will show the brief explanation on mycotoxin panels. So I've just zoomed in and highlighted, or not highlighted, I'm sorry, but I've zoomed in on the specific one that came back positive on this report was the trichothecene family. If you look and it shows that stachybotrys is the mold that produces it, and we list the different types of mycotoxins that are within the trichothecene family on the left, and then the list of cellular activity that the mycotoxin can affect, specifically DNA and RNA and protein synthesis. They can be immunosuppression. They can have multiple symptoms like nasal inflammation, mucus secretion that's excessive. You can have problems with your nose and the olfactory system with smelling. You can have nausea, vomiting, weight loss, and it crosses the cell membrane easily. Then the third um, part of this is your symptoms and others where there are multiple diagnoses. Patients can have bleeding disorders, they can be diagnosed with central and peripheral nervous disorders. It's gonna be found in damp and wet damaged environments. They can, it can be due to poor air quality. And again, humidity and poor ventilation increases the risk of mold growth. You can have the respiratory, both acute and chronic health problems. Um, it can grow on wood, ceiling tiles, fiber, dry wood, dry board and um, it can grow in your HVAC systems or your ducts, and that it's also absorbed through the mouth and through the skin. And then again, another list of the associations with your disease state. So I've concluded my presentation for real-time lab on mold and mycotoxins. I hope that you've learned a lot, and I'm gonna turn it back over to uh, the host. Thank you so much, Dr. Seymour. That was really amazing. Uh, Dr. Sedano, do you have any questions or insight that you would like to add? Uh, no, Dr. Seymour covered everything uh, e expertly. Um, so uh, um, really, I don't have much much to add, but I would add, well, I would say that oftentimes when you look at the amount of symptoms associated with this, you're going to probably need to look for that because I have a feeling there's a lot more uh, mold issues uh, than we actually, you know, consider, which is why taking a good history will help lead to uh, finding out or discovering mold, particularly in environmental history, which uh, Doc may tell you, Dr. Seymour, let you know, I'm sure they do an environmental history on all of their patients because you, you don't need to do that. And that could be a missing link. So I would encourage listeners to add that environmental history to, uh, to you know, to their right traditional history. Okay. That's great. Well, doctor, it seems you've done such a great job. You've filled in all the the the, the whole picture. Uh, it doesn't appear there's any questions. Um, so I'm going to move on to the uh, final slides of the presentation here that uh, cover the Avexia portion. Um, so I'm just reminding everyone that we have an Ask the Doctor Results Interpretation um, service that Dr. Sedano heads up. Uh, it's a free service available to all the clients. Um, uh, he he will through um, email 
he'll go over results. You submit the results. Um, if you want, there's also a live uh, video session availability for a small fee. Um, and once you log in, you can see that there's an Ask the Doctor link on the left-hand side of the dashboard that uh, you go right there and explain the whole process. Uh, you can set up either type of consultation. Um, so that uh, if you have any questions uh, relative to any of the tests that we offer and including uh, mycotoxin testing. And now that we've learned so much about mycotoxins and the testing, I would like to review how to order the tests before concluding the webinar. Uh, first, you, you'll see here, uh, it's very easy. First, you'll need to log into your Vexia account and you go to a Vexia link uh, ordering banner, which is along the left side again with your quick links. Uh, you click on it, and then you're going to need to select or create a patient to assign the test to, uh, then select specialty labs, and then go to the real-time laboratories uh, tests and locate the mycotoxin panel. And then finally, complete the test order by clicking the green Place the Order button. It's just that simple. Thank you. Uh, for any questions or issues you may have, contact Avexia Diagnostics by email at info at aveciadiagnostics.com or by phone five days a week at extended hours, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern Time at 888-852-2723, um, or we have a chat uh, function on our website. Um, a recording of this webinar will be available by email in the next few days. And we'd like to thank Dr. Seymour and Dr. Sanam for this informative presentation. Thank you again for joining us for this webinar event. Until next time, from everyone at Avexia Diagnostics and Real-Time Laboratories, stay healthy, stay safe, and we wish you all the best on your pathway to wellness. Thank you again, Doctor. All right. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Dr. Sanam. Thank you, Dr. Seymour. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Good okay. Night. Good night. Good night.